Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath Services. Today, we're going to put on our scholarly hats, as it were, so we can understand some of the truth of God. Now, it's very important as we're coming up to the Passover time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread that we understand the purpose of it and the right timing of it. Because Paul wrote that in the night that he was betrayed. Okay? Now, that's important to understand. Now, let's ask a question before we get into things here. Why is there so much confusion concerning the Passover? Well, first of all, because Satan wants to destroy the knowledge of it. And he has people willing to work for him to do it, to insert their own self-righteous ideas into it, thinking that they are doing the will of God. But let's just review a few things that Jesus said. Number one, he said in Matthew 4.4, 4, Luke 4.4, 4, quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, man shall not live by bread alone. That means every man, woman, and child. But by every word of God. So in today's world, there are people out there perverting the word of God. Let's also remember what Jesus said in John 17, 17. He said to the Father, sanctify them, that is, make them holy with your truth. All right? Now, let's come to Psalm 119. And let's see something very important here concerning truth. Because... God is a God of truth, and there is no lie in him. And who is the father of lies? None other than Satan, the devil, and it says at the end time that he's deceiving the whole world. And the ones that he wants to come and really deceive will be those who have the Spirit of God. Because he's got the whole world locked up in his system. Okay. Psalm 119. Okay. Verse 142. Now, sometimes in a single verse, it tells us a lot. And we need to think about what it tells us so that we get a full understanding of it. And we're going to see that in addition to false scholars and false teachers, God has preserved true scholars all the way down through history so that we will have the truth at the end times. Okay? Now, Psalm 119 and verse 142 your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Huh. Okay. Let's come over here to verse 172. My tongue shall speak of your word. That's what we are to do. What did Paul tell Timothy? Preach the word. In season and out of season. For the time will come that they will not tolerate the truth, but will want to have myths and follow after the teachings of men. That's a little paraphrasing there. Now, finishing verse 172. 
for all. You might go through and every time you see all, circle it. That means each and every one, right? Your commandments are righteousness. Now, this also tells us what? If his righteousness is everlasting righteousness, okay, then his commandments are righteous and are everlasting. So anyone who says they've been done away do not understand. Okay. Now let's come down here to one more. Let's come to verse 151. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. Now let's understand something else here that's important which is this. If there's going to be any change to the laws of God, God must do the changing. Okay? That's why Christ came to bring the spirit of the law. And he also came to become, number one, the sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. Number two, to become high priest for the people of God in heaven above. That's where he is, not the people in heaven above, but Christ in heaven above for the people on the earth. Okay? All your commandments are truth. Now, Let's come to verse 160. Very interesting. Your, root, your word is true from the beginning. See, this is why Satan likes to have scholars come along and insert things or change things a little here and a little there. Sometimes a whole lot. Now let's finish this verse. And every one of your righteous commandments endures forever. Okay? Now, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Okay? Now then, concerning the temple sacrifices and the priest laws, the sacrifice now is Christ. And the priest laws no longer apply in the way that he set up the priesthood under the old covenant. But that did not get rid of the rest of the commandments of God. What God did was replace the letter of the law commandment for the spirit of the law. Not just that you do the out, outward things of the law, but that you have them written in your heart and in your mind. So that's a higher level. So whenever someone says, well, God did away with this or that or the other, remind them he replaced it with something of a higher spiritual Value is not the sacrifice of Christ better than all the sacrifices at the temple? Is not praying to God directly in heaven above greater than making a journey to Jerusalem to go to a temple? Yes. Is not Jesus' statements there of loving God loving your enemies greater than what he had in the Old Testament. Yes, indeed. Okay. So anything that has been changed has been raised 
to a high spiritual level. And that's what the Passover is all about. Now, we're going to get into that today. Let's come to Matthew 28. All right. Let's see what Jesus commanded the disciples. Okay. This becomes important, and this is why we have the four Gospels, and we have all the epistles. I tell you what. This is a quick read for everybody. But you might take a little time to think about it as you're reading. Read 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Ask the question, is there any hint that God, through Christ, did away with any of his laws? Okay. Now, there's some mistranslations in 1 John, the third chapter, where the word practice, you shall not practice sin. The one who is converted will not practice sin. But the King James reads, cannot sin. In that particular case, the word practice applies to everyone who is practicing lawlessness is sinning. The word practice is there in the faithful version. Okay. And it's down below. You can read it there in the faithful version. Practice. And that carries through all the verses. And think about this for a minute. You just go back and read the first chapter of 1 John, and it says, if anyone sins, huh, he's writing to Christians, right? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And if we confess our sins, what? He'll forgive us our sins. And in 1 John 5, if we see a brother sin is sin not unto death, we're to pray for him. Now, with all of that said, we're going to cover some things concerning the Passover. Because the Passover is the key thing for the New Testament. Now, let's come to Matthew 28, verse 18. Verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Well, that's quite a sweeping statement, right? Not delegated to men. Not given to a pope. God's word is overall coming directly from Christ. Therefore, go and make disciples in all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that is not establishing a trinity. Because when we baptize, we do it this way. Baptize you into the name of the Father for the begettle of the Holy Spirit and of the Son because his sacrifice paid for your sins to be blotted out and of the Holy Spirit which God alone can send. Okay? So don't let anybody tell you that this is Trinitarian. It doesn't establish it at all and we got a brand new booklet coming out what is the Holy Spirit? And it is the finest booklet on the Holy Spirit ever produced. Stephen Green and I worked on this, and he put it together. 
And it goes through in great detail. All right, now let's continue. Okay, verse 20 is the key. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. All things. All right. And lo, I am with you always, even until the consummation of the age or the completion of the age. Okay. He will never leave us. Isn't that what Jesus said in in Hebrews 13, I will not ever leave you. No, I will not forsake you. And in the Greek, there are five negatives. Not, will not, never. Now, if Jesus said that, and he's the way, the truth, and the life, guess what that means? He will not ever leave us, See? even though we become few. Now here on live streaming, you're still assembling together, though you are alone, because it's the Sabbath day and we're studying the word of God. Now, let me continue on for here for a minute, okay? Okay. Now, first of all, we have online, and you can download it. This is Passover in the Bible and Church Today by Lester Graby and Robert L. Kuhn. This you need to have, and it has all my comments that I wrote on it when I first got it in 1978 at the Elders Conference in Pasadena. Now then, let me explain what happened. Before I, I get to that, understand this. The takedown of Worldwide was because of the sins of the ministers, Herbert Armstrong, and the brethren. Now, concerning Herbert Armstrong, I know from first-person testimony who talked to him during the last two years of his life that he repented of his sins. However, there were those who were infiltrators that came into the church. Robert Kuhn, Stan Rader. Now then, if you understand one thing, Robert Kuhn was a temple-going Man, he had, I think, three Ph.D. degrees. He came from the Kuhn Loeb banking family in New York to Pasadena to be a student. And they gave him the job of wiping up excess ink off the floor of the press where they printed the plain truth. Okay? Didn't take them long to get Garner Ted Armstrong's attention. And that was his main object, to control Ted. That was pretty simple. little scotch and women and you've got them controlled. Stan Rader was to control Herbert Armstrong which he ended up doing. But right during the 
third year before he died, the few righteous ones in Pasadena were able to set up a meeting with him to convince him to fire Stan Rader. Okay. Now we have to back up a little bit so you understand what happens. Okay. And the background as to why this paper was written and it was written the, the first shot over the bow to come after the true Passover of God. And in this, it's written that they didn't even know where the name of the Passover came from. What does it say in Exodus 12? This is the Lord's, what? Passover, right? Okay. Now, let me just add one more thing. I know first-person testimony from a man named Timmons. He and his wife, were the ones who sued Worldwide Church of God so that it went into receivership. But who advised them to do it? And my knowledge is first-person testimony from his mouth to my ears. Robert L. Kuhn advised them to sue under the Charitable Law Acts. The case went to a judge in Los Angeles who was a Jew. The prosecutor was a Jew. Duke Machen was running for governor and he needed the Jewish vote. Now, why did they want to do this? Because Herbert Armstrong had congestive heart failure and was in Tucson. And they thought that when he heard the church was put into receivership and locked up all the finances that he would drop dead of a heart attack. And who would have taken over? Stanley R. Raider. Well, God didn't let that happen. Okay? He did not let that happen. So, Raider then could not be exposed for what he was, so, he had to defend the church. And he got a Petrus law by Assemblyman Petrus, passed in Sacramento, that churches cannot be taken into receivership under charitable laws because they are churches, not charities. Okay? Okay? Now then, with all of that said, I want you to understand what they were doing with the Passover. And I want you also to know that all of this I knew before I resigned in 1979. Okay? So I didn't resign on a whim. I resigned to stand for the truth. And I remember God inspired me, and I remember the exact words to this very day. And I remember standing in the pulpit with Ron Reedy and Leroy Neff. Okay? And I prayed that they wouldn't come and take me down while I was speaking. 
But I said that unless there is someone standing in the pulpit in Pasadena today telling the church to amend their ways, that the forces of evil would be set in motion to destroy the church. Now that had to be God's inspiration because I didn't have any of that in my notes. All I had was a listing of scriptures. Question, did that happen? Yes, but it took 12 years, okay? And the disintegration of the church started with the changing of the Passover from the true day to the Jewish day. And then when all of the ones who took down worldwide and changed the doctrines, now they keep the Lord's Supper. In some cases, every week. So you see how important the true Passover is. And every one of us have a duty to guard the truth and to keep the truth ourselves in our own minds as the central focus of what we do and what we believe. Okay? Now then. Let's come to Exodus 12 for just a minute. And I have a King James Version here. And this occurred to me at my first Passover in 1961. Okay. Talking about the lamb. Exodus 12. Verse 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Okay, then they were to get a lamb on the 10th day of, of the month, verse 2. Then it gives the instruction there is to be one per household, or if the household is too small, then two small households take it together. Shall be without blemish, verse 5. You can take it from the sheep or from the goats. Keep that in mind because kid goats can also signify Christ as a, by the sacrifice of it. Now notice, here's the key verse, verse 6. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Question becomes, what is evening? And the whole paper of Kuhn and Graby revolves around misinterpreting evening. And they were not even honest enough to go to the original Hebrew to tell us the time. Okay? Now let's read on. Okay? Then they're put to the blood on the doorpost and on, on the lentil. They were to roast it with fire and eat it with unleavened bread. Keep that in mind. Now notice verse 9, because this becomes important when we come to Deuteronomy 16. Because there's another complete misinterpretation by the Jews, which is followed to this day. A 15th Passover based upon their interpretation of Deuteronomy 16. And the King James has made a mistranslation that we'll talk about later. So he says, you shall not eat of it raw 
or sodden, that is, boiled in water. That becomes important. Keep that in mind for later on. But roast with fire, with the head and legs and with the pertinence thereof, that means the heart and the liver and the kidneys. And you shall let nothing remain until morning. Okay? Then you're to burn it with fire. All right? Verse 18. Talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I remember Ron Kelly standing in the pulpit explaining this when he read it. That was 1961, okay? In the first month of the 14th day of the month at even. So he said, this even is the next even. But over here, it says you're to keep it up until the 14th day of the first month. Huh. So I said to myself, how do I know that? He didn't explain it. And it was never explained, and it was never taught in worldwide the way it should have been taught. And to this day, there are churches of God who call the Passover the Lord's Supper when Paul said, it is not the Lord's Supper. Supper. Okay? You can't get any stronger than that. All right? Now then, I started doing a lot of research. Actually, what happened after I resigned in 79, we started the Biblical Church of God. And we had to leave that because those men wanted to set up a hierarchy like worldwide. And they were evil and mean to us. And so we just had to quit that. And we started the Christian Biblical Church of God. And I decided that should be the name because there was not enough Christianity in the Biblical Church of God. Because... These men turned out to be politicians wanting to control. And they wanted to control so much that they even said, we don't want you putting your name on anything that you write. I said, huh. That's very inviting, isn't it? To write a letter to dear community. Huh? You want to know who wrote it? That was just one of miserable things that we went through. So I quit writing after we left. 1983 until 1992. I didn't write a thing. The reason I didn't was because I said to myself, God has provided seven faithful brethren and if my job between now and the return of Christ is to take care of these seven brethren to see them faithfully into the, their place of safety in the grave, then that's my mission in life. And I'm not going to try and do some big thing and run down the road and say, this is the work of God, this is the work of God, and people must follow it. No. I stayed with that group of seven. Everything started with that. And that's when I first sat down to speak. Just think how stupid it would have been to have a lectern and stand up and look down at seven people. That would have been arrogant and overbearing. Okay? So, for that 10 years, I didn't write a thing. However, starting in 1990, I did start translating the general epistles. And I made study papers with a column about this wide and side columns to write on about that wide. And we started with James and then 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, John, and Jude. Okay? Then, 
I got a letter. Because the Passover problem had come up again. And this person, please ask me to fully explain it and to write him back on it. So that's when I began to write again. Okay. And I had Carl Franklin and Jeannie back in Michigan, his, Jeannie, his wife. And they did the editing. And I started out by saying to the brethren here in this area, and by that time we had about 14 or 15 people with us because different ones came at different times. And I said, I'm going to have to write about the Passover, so we're going to have to be very thorough with it. So we want to cover everything we need to cover, and I think it'll be about 75 pages, okay? Well, I was writing and writing and writing, and Jeannie and Carl were editing and sending it back, and we were doing the corrections and got up to 75 pages, and we had just barely started. So I said, well, maybe it'll be 125 pages, okay? So we're writing, 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 put it together, and getting all the problems and difficulties concerning the Passover. And so finally, I got to 150 pages. And everyone was laughing at me because it was expanding. Well, what happened, okay, it turned out to be 300 pages. And here is the first edition of the Passover book published in 1993, okay, and I corrected all the problems of Exodus and Deuteronomy, they're there, okay. Then, in 1995, I made a trip to Nashville, Tennessee. And Bob and Evelyn Honeycutt. They met me at the airport, and Bob had to do something because he was a building contractor. And so Evelyn said, How'd you like to go to Books a Million? And I said, Well, what's that? She said, Well, it's a big bookstore that is quite a chain in the Middle West, in the Midwest. So she took me over there. And guess what the first place I went to was? where the Bibles were on display, okay? And I found this Bible, the Shachan Bible, volume number one, The Five Books of Moses by Everett Fox. So, having written what we had written for the Passover book up to that time, all right? First thing I did was see, was he honest? Did he translate the proper translation of the Hebrew words, Bain Ha'arba'im, which means between the two evenings, and Ba'erev, which means sunset. Because that's how I wrote it in the first edition of the Passover book. Okay? Now, remember, this was published in 93. I didn't have this until 95. All right? So, let's read verse 6. All right, then we'll read it in the faithful version. Verse 6, And it, that is Passover lamb, shall be for you in safekeeping until the 14th day after the new moon or, or the first day of the month, and they are to slay it. See, it's not an offering at the temple. Where were the Israelites on their first Passover? at home, okay? Now we'll see something else in a little bit. And the entire assembly of the congregation of Israel 
shall slay it between the setting times. Benhar Baim. And I remember Belinda Davis, when I was giving this in series of sermons and so forth, and giving it after that, she came up to me one day and she said, if I hear Bain or Arbaim again, I'm going to scream. <laughs> okay. Between the setting time, Bain or Arbaim, and that is correct. Okay. Now, you come to verse 11, and it says you're to eat it in haste. That's not correct. You're to eat it in trepidation, and that's how Fox has it. All right? Now, let's come to verse 18 and see how Fox translated that. Now, remember, I had it translated, and we'll read it in just a minute. Bef two years before I ever saw this book. Verse 18, and in the first month on the 14th day of the month at sunset, you are to eat matzos. Now that's referring to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Until the 21st day of the month at sunset. What ends the day and begins the new one? sunset that and I looked at that standing there in the bookstore and I said that's it he's got it right and I felt really good about that okay now verse 21 and Moses had all the elders of Israel called and said to them pick out and take yourselves a sheep for your clans and slay the Passover animal. Doesn't say offering. Animal. Last part of verse 22. Now you, you are not to go out, any man or that is anyone from the entrance to his house until daybreak. In this paper by Kuhn and Graby, they lie and say that the Jews or the Israelites at that time reckoned the new day to begin at midnight. That is an absolute blatant lie. And they could leave as soon as the firstborn of the Egyptians were slain at midnight. Have you tried to herd flocks of goats and sheep and cattle and horses at night, midnight. Okay. But there were those people who said, oh, this is so good. See? Because they were never grounded in the truth. And that's what we're going to do today. Ground everyone in the truth. Because everything that we do must be done by the truth of God as he wants it. Let's take a break. I'll see you in 20 minutes. <music> 